Riff listeners, welcome back to another episode. We're continuing our series, Leadership 101, with special guest, Scott Bybee. He's been a North Pointer for a long time and been super instrumental in launching the Dream Center and being a great partner for North Point as a whole. So Jeremy sits down with Scott. Let's dive into this episode. Well, thanks for uh, tuning in today, whether you're joining us on YouTube so you can see that we both shaved today, um, or uh, if you're just... uh, Uh, joining us through any of our audio options. Glad to have you. Uh, Today, I have one of my friends, Scott Vibey, who's joining us. Scott, welcome Uh, to The Riff. Thrilled to be here. Long time listener. (laughs) That's that's good. Yeah, ever since the beginning, so right on board. That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you what, is I've been looking forward to this for hours now. So this is is a highlight. (laughs) Um, Scott, we're going to talk all things Life of Scott. Um, We're going to talk, I want to talk about your business. Business. We're in a series right now. Um, if you're if you're listening to this as it drops, we're in a series at North Point on Leadership 101, talking about how um, really the goal is not to be super successful as much as to follow Jesus in whatever aspect. And and so as we've been walking through that on the weekends, um, I, I wanted to make sure we had an opportunity to have an extended conversation with you before we dive into business. Before we dive into uh, uh, serving the community around you, which I, I'm excited to do, I am aware that you have won some awards in athletics. Is that true? Well, that's the, what I assumed you were having me on for to talk about athletics and our proud my like abilities and skills in, in the athletic world because that's what most of my podcast appearances are really about. <laughs> that doesn't so, surprise me. So your thirty I'm, for thirty hasn't dropped yet. <laughs> so that's, that's a great point. I need to let ESPN know that I'm available. <laughs> you for that. should. They're no, probably yeah. watching, but I, uh, what, what sports are, are you well, particularly proud of? The one that we won a championship in most recently was the City of Springfield Wiffle Ball Championship. So as a team, team member... Come on! Yes, we, we did. But that's been a couple years now because we're kind of semi-retired, I think. We, we shut the league down. We shut the league down. Um, but, yeah. but you were like, like... I know some of our listeners, I could just sense it. They're not. They're underimpressed uh, when we say wiffle ball championship. They have no idea the the level of competition that there is no. in this town for that. Some of the title. best right. uh, co-ed junior high teams right. in the league. Yes. We were uh, the old guys. <laughs> yeah, we were the old guys. But uh, you know, your brother, you, yes. and Ryan Cantrell, uh, we, we, and Jason Eising, yep. Eisminger. Yep. Right. You know, so we had a stack team. Shout out to those guys. We, we yeah. Did so it. if you're listening, if you're All not right. listening, uh, you ought to. But. Uh, so yeah, we 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 uh, we enjoy. We've also played tennis together. Correct. And you wouldn't even say that you were a tennis player back then. I'm still not. But you're an athlete. Uh, you're one of the few people I've ever seen do a Superman dive <laughs> on a non clay tennis court surface. I, I have a, a gift or a curse that I won't give up on a ball, and that yeah. doesn't surface doesn't matter. I'm still not going to give up, and so I no, that's a curse. Injure myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's a curse. Even though I don't even care that much about tennis, I just never. Can quite it's the competitive gene I have that makes me do stupid stuff like that. So, I like it. Yeah. I like it. Well, we we share some of those genetics. Um, well, uh, Scott, uh, tell us a little bit about. I mean, uh, your your journey. Uh, you've been in Missouri, so start kind of at birth, end with now. Hit the highlights. Give us the four one one on Scott. Um, so I was born in Missouri. My dad was an engineer, and I was born in Clinton. Train conductor? Not a train conductor. The the uh, engineer design type. Oh, so, okay. Yes, right. Okay. And uh, he was working at a power plant up in mid Missouri, and I was born in Clinton, and we moved to Springfield when I was five. So I'm a lifelong Springfield person, Springfield flag. All right. right there, so. Oh, so you're on Team on, New Flag. I am. Like, I mean, yeah, I don't want right. to be divisive. No, I know. I know. But <laughs> that's a whole, that's controversy. You no, want to do that? I, I kind of like it. If, but uh, so, Spring, lifelong Springfield person. I grew up in uh, the North Side. So I'm a North Sider. Hillcrest. I went to Hillcrest, went to Pleasant View. And uh, met my wife at Drury, so I'm married to Robin, and she was a diver there, an amazing athlete herself. Wow. Got third in the nation. Okay, time out. Third yes. in the nation diving. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Not NCAA, in NA, AIA. So, uh, you know what? You know, what? I'm still impressed. I always poker with that, but it's yeah. still impressive. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what place did you get? <laughs> exactly in the nation, <laughs> yeah. and I've never been third in the nation at anything, even wiffle ball. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, one, I'm I'm curious. Um, so, would you like go watch them practice or something? Yes, the swimmers. I, w- I would. <laughs> I would go watch her dive, and that's an awful experience because okay. you, in a, as a diver, you jump off this three meter board and you don't execute the dive properly, and you smack or whatever, 
there's no crying or wiping off the tears or the, she'd get like blood spots on her skin from hitting the water so hard. You have to swim to the side, go up and do it again. Like oh, that's wow. how it, that works. So it was emotional wow. to watch these now, girls. Now I know why you play wiffle ball. Yes, right. So anyway, she was very talented. She had a gymnastics background as a okay. child. So she did that and, and she became a diver. So. You guys hit it off right away? Yes, date dash. Uh, it's kind of like a setup thing through the fraternity and sorority things we were involved with okay. over there. So she came over. I was had my skater haircut at that time, and she fell in love. And uh, really, so Tony Hawk influence a little bit. I mean, not like a lot, but that's what she calls it. Had a little flip. So okay, if you okay. can imagine that, given what you're looking at today, it's yeah, yeah. I, so. yeah I, I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. So, um, so you guys uh, got married right out of college. Yes, right out of college, we both graduated the same year. I'd gone to Rolla for engineering, and she graduated from Drury. So the same week, we got married um, and then went on honeymoon, came back, bought a house, and started new jobs up at uh, Lake of the Ozarks. I worked there for a few years before we transitioned back to Springfield Okay, when we started thinking about having kids. So you got, get out of, get out of uh, Rolla with an engineering major. Uh, you, you go right into the biz? Yep, right. And this wasn't our business. So I was working for another company. I didn't want to be... The guy that goes to work, cause my dad was running ESC at that time. He had started yeah. ESC in our basement 30 years ago. And so he was, you know, that was a growing business that I could have come to work at, but I didn't want to start working for dad right away. And so yeah. we had, you know, three hours away was a good spot for us or actually an hour and a half like yeah. the Ozarks. And we, uh, we kind of started our lives on our own up there and, and did well and joined a little church up there and kind of got our lives together and then came to Springfield in 1999. Okay, and then and was that, were you joining uh, the team there at ESC in yep. 99? came back and started working for dad. So how long How long did you work with your dad? And, and then, then at what point did you uh, kind of uh, move up into to leadership? How'd that work? Well, so and I ESC was, is? ESC is our consultant engineering firm that I, our family started and we do food process, electrical, mechanical, consulting for food manufacturers, chemical companies, drug manufacturers, some cool things that we do. All um, over the nation. All over the nation. Kind of regional, but also, I mean, our biggest client the last few years has been in California. So that's okay. a little bit weird, but yeah, that's how it works. So yeah, so I started working there in 99. My dad was the president at that time and he transitioned slowly out, but I kind of rapidly at the end, he had a, a health problem with a heart valve replacement. So okay. he, in 2006, said, Scott, you're gonna be the president. And wow. so he was out and he didn't like hang around. I mean, he kind of helped us do some building addition work in his first year after retirement. And after that, no one, he didn't come back. So, wow. you know, he comes back for the picnics and the parties, but, uh, <laughs> and he did that to, uh, you know, kind of make sure everyone knew that I was the president. I would have loved for him to stick around a few years longer and like ease me transition into it, but yeah. uh, it worked out. So. Well, okay, so just the leadership part, um, a question on that is taking over, obviously you didn't, you didn't want to go there and just kind of ride dad's coattails Correct, vibe. Yeah, right. So you went and started on your own somewhere else. And then when you joined forces, even taking over, there's got to be some weird dynamics. How was that transition for you? Did you, were you able to save the team? Were there, how did that work? Well, no one left. So I guess I saved the team, but okay. I mean, we have such a good team of people that are, have the right heart and the right mindset. I mean, no one's there. If you're at ESC, you're not there to climb a corporate ladder because it's very obvious there's 35 people at the time. There's probably less than 30 working yeah. there. You, you can turn around and say, you're not there to like, you know, become the VP or whatever title you're looking for because we all, we're all pulling weight and we're all just working alongside it as a team. So when I became president, I mean, I got a few jabs and pokes and people making fun of me, but I really came at it trying to be super humble about it because it's like, you can't go in and say, well, I'm the president now when you're just the son of the, you know, I mean, I had done enough to like give him confidence that I wouldn't screw it up, I hope. <laughs> but yeah. I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the president and no one, I don't think doubted that I could probably tackle it, but I also uh. didn't know what I was doing. And I, I made a lot of mistakes the first 10 years and I'm probably still making them now, obviously, but yeah. uh, I made a lot of probably bigger ones and not, being a proactive leader and just kind of letting things go. There's probably some things that could have been addressed or should have been addressed that I didn't tackle because I was 
didn't want to rock the boat too much. So yeah, that kind of thing. So, so, so at what point did you start thinking, man, I think this, I think this fits well. My job? Yeah. I don't know. Um, still working on that maybe. Like sometimes yeah. I'm like, you know, I should probably just be an engineer. I'm not really qualified to be a good leader because in our business system, I'm called the visionary. We, we run the EOS traction process. So yeah. I'm the visionary. And I know I'm like, I'm not a visionary. I'm just, you know, just trying to please clients and please our employees and, and, and serve everyone well. But I, I don't know that I'm like a, when I think of visionary, I think of someone that's not me. But that's, yeah. that's the title that I kind of have at the office. So Maybe that makes you a good one. <laughs> I don't know. That, you know, that could be debated. You know, uh, that the, the traction process, yep. and I know it's kind of geeking out here for some business people, but uh, you uh, really introduced me to some of the, the traction process. Right. And um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, how was that helpful for your organization? Because, you know, we're talking about business. I think that's a value for even sure. this podcast is, if, uh, what does that bring to your team? Well, for us, it was like a, a turnkey way to execute business stuff that implements a lot of good topics that we had talked about for years with uh, different folks that have been on our team, you know, Jim Collins, Good to Great, and all these different concepts and getting the right people on the right seat on the bus and a lot of good stuff, even right. some Dave Ramsey, Entree Leadership stuff that we had done. It kind of all put it in one easily, hey, here's a book, you do these steps and you'll have you know, regular team meetings, you'll have people feel engaged, you'll kind of track stuff on a scorecard, which as engineers we like, Yeah, and and you'll be always tackling tough issues. And that's the one thing I didn't do yeah. starting out in 2006 was tackle a few tough issues that we had in our business with of how we worked and how we had handled client situations and things like that. And there was dif differing ideas on, within the team on how some of those things should go. And I was like, people would come to me and say, you know, we, we really need to, you know, fix this little problem. And it could be a big problem or a small problem. And I'd be like, yeah, I, that's a problem. We need to do that. And then I'd go back to engineering because I was good at engineering and not good at leading. So it was easy for me to just get in my little box. What traction does is it forces you through processing of issues all the time and, and having everyone at a table discussing openly what the issues are. It yeah. forces you to address things that you maybe yeah. wouldn't have tackled on your own, but the team tackles them. So it's like, you're not the bad guy. It just kind of comes out and, and everybody attacks it and, and, issues are addressed. So. Uh, that's one of the things I've appreciated uh, about that process that you introduced me to um, was it's easy for me naturally to try and hide behind a positive anecdotal story to make everyone feel good. Right. And I'll feel like my goal as a leader is to create harmony for the team. But really the true goal is to create health for a team right. and traction will say, okay, hey, we're going to naturally lean into some harmonious moments, but what are some things? It, be, it becomes very intentional to have conversations that aren't emotional about uh, growth opportunities. Sure. Yeah, so. growth opportunities. That's a good word for it. <laughs> because I want harmony. So right. I say it. No, I would, yes. <laughs> well, I'm Mr. No Conflict. Like I will avoid conflict at almost any cost. Yeah. So that was my natural way to run the business. And that was causing business health problems. Like to your yeah. point, I was not healthy for leading the business. So we have now adjusted through the traction process and are doing much better at tackling some of the tough issues. So, well, Okay, so a couple of things I want to talk about uh, with your business and then, and then we'll pull the string back and see how we got there. But you are located, we're, we're actually filming this at the Dream Center right. uh, in a production suite, which is fancy talk for old auditorium. Right. Um, but you are Kitty Corner, your business ESC is Kitty Corner from the Dream Center. Yes, right. I can see it from this room. Yeah. So yes. And and you actually you had connection to Hamlin uh, Church that was here <clears throat> back years ago. Yes. Our my I attended here in college because that's where my parents were going. We went to college, and my wife and I got married thirty yards from here. So wow. In the same room. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I thought I felt something. Yeah, so, I know. Uh, uh, so so here's what's, what's kind of cool, and, and most people probably wouldn't know this, but you have this this company that's doing big things, uh, lots of deadlines. You got goals you got to hit, and you have made it very clear on several occasions to the entire Dream Center team: if you need something, call us. We can run over right away and help. Um, 
And you have, uh, we've taken you up on that. There's been times where you've seen us not take you up on it and you have uh, come over, hung blinds, uh, helped carry things. Um, You all have been a neighbor uh, to the Dream Center and have helped lift the burden. But one of the things that uh, blows my mind is as a business owner, um, I've, I've come in once to a meeting where you, you were sharing, you had a goal for giving back to the community. One of the ways you give back to the community was making a donation as a business to the Dream Center. And I know you do that with others. Um, but one of the things you said in that meeting, it just struck me, uh, was some of you um, are, I just want you all to know that you're part of something bigger than this. And I want you all to feel like you have hours and you gave a certain number of hours that we want you to give back. And here's a couple of ways you can give back to the community, whether it's the Dream Center or this area. And I want you to do that on the clock. It's part of who we right. are as an organization. <laughs> what are you thinking? Where did that come from? And wow, that was so amazing. Well, I mean, we have a goal. Like I mentioned, we have scorecard goals. We have goals for, for revenue and goals for backlog and, and income and all these different business things. But we have yeah. a goal for how much we give back to the community just because I think it's that important. I mean, my dad started the business with a foundation of generosity towards the employees. Um, do not withhold good from those who deserve it kind of thing. Whenever you're setting on money that's come in from the business, that's what he used. Okay, time out. That, so do not withhold good from those who deserve it. Yeah. That principle from an owner's mentality, that's, that's unique. Well, yeah, and that, but that's all we've ever known. Too. So that's how we've just proceeded as a business. And I've done yeah. the, the same thing that he kind of started with how we're generous with employees, but being generous with employees um, is good start, but being generous with the community is, is also great. Because one thing that I've commented before, we are engineers, we do projects that sometimes they're great and they have big ramifications. They last a long time and they're making all sorts of products that's on people's shelves and you're really making you know, good things happen. Sometimes they go nowhere or they die because of a marketing failure or the product just didn't take off. You know, we did this new product and just, you know, sometimes there's their failures. So you invest your whole life into this project and then a year later, you're, you're helping them engineer how to replace it. Okay. So it's like, those are all very short term um, wins. Right. And so investing in people's lives and the community is a long term win. So you're, you're making an investment in something that's eternal when you're investing in people, as opposed to investing in some project for some client that, you know, is just looking at us as a service provider and not really even a partner. You yeah. know, they're just pay for service kind of thing. And it's a transactional and short term, whereas stuff we do in the community makes a difference for people long term. So, so have you ever had pushback from uh, staff or conversations like, hey, wh- <clears throat> why do we do this? No, I mean, at this point, that's kind of like baked into the interview process that they know that, hey, we're going to pray at meetings. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's, you know, be aware. And we're going to give back to the community. And most people are on board with that coming in. That, that's how we attract people at yeah. this point because they hear about, say, I want to be part of that. So that's, I've never had anybody come to me and say, yes, we shouldn't give this or we shouldn't do that or that's being too generous. Yeah, People just... Are, that, that's something that gives them energy. It doesn't take energy away from them as yeah. far as how they look at it, which is a credit to them, not a credit to our company. That's Our, our team right. is great. Well, what I, I love about your approach and how I've described my observation of seeing you in action in that meeting is um, you don't preach with your words as much as you point with your life towards Jesus. And I love that is because sometimes we feel like we have to compartmentalize um, that we need to make sure that we don't offend in a business world. And so we can park some of our values, even being very vocal about our values. How have you figured out how to display the values that are in your heart or in your dad's heart right. and do so without coming across as um, self-righteous? Well, I'm sure I do come across as self-righteous. That's, <laughs> that's always a worry that I have. Like, I, yeah. Cause I don't want to come across like, oh, ESC is doing this great and Scott's this yeah. great. I'm not, I'm just kind of like following the lead that was started by the family and I'm just keeping it rolling. And then our team is so great now that if I, if I got hit by a truck tomorrow, they would still run it more or less the same way. I don't think anything would change. So it's nothing I'm doing. It's really stuff that, 
that God kind of planted the, cur- the, the seeds in the kernels with, and we're just continuing it to go on. And the team is on board. Yeah. So, it's, but What's no, that? I'm sure I am self righteous sometimes. And I, I often have to, like, if I'm doing stuff where we're talking about leadership or, or, personal interactions or some things, I will draw from like Andy Stanley and all these people that have great content. And I'll say, I'm, sh- you know, I'll send an email or I'll have a team. And it's like, I will pre-, pre-, pre say, I may come across as preachy, but yeah. this, but. So I just, if you stay yeah. at the beginning, like if I'm, I apologize for coming across as preachy, then you can say whatever you want after that. And they, <laughs> it's fine. I'm going to start saying <laughs> yes. that at the beginning of every one of right. my messages. <laughs> Well, you do come across as true, but that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you, that's kind of positional. It's given that when you're standing up there, that's going to come across that way. I guess that's yes, my right. job. Uh, so let, let's back the uh, uh, the tape up a little bit in the sense of when, when did faith, I mean, when did faith become uh, just primary importance to you? What did that journey look like? Well, so my dad kind of rededicated his life when we were in the process of building a new house back in, 79, 80 and interest rates went through crazy. And I could see he was under stress at work and he was under stress um, with building this house. And I could see a change then. And that's kind of when he made the decision to really rededicate his life. And it was obvious to me as a five, six year old, that was important. And then he also, mm-hmm. at that point, and I didn't know about it then, but that's when he decided we're gonna start tithing. We, Cause it was like getting not good financially for, for the interest rates and the people know the history that got pretty high. Yeah. Like we're gonna, Tithe as part of that rededication, and that, and describe tithe to to you for those. Yes, who, right. Yes, yeah. well, just the tenth of his income. Okay, um, you know, and that. So during a time of financial crunch, that's the time <clears throat> he decides to. Yeah, because that's the time he's like, you know, you kind of hit it. Like when you decide, you decide, and so that he did that. Okay, and then you know, it's God just kept showing up in ways, you know, personally and financially and family relation wise that like this is. The thing, so they started from there and just kept growing in generosity and the business. You know, at that time he was not working at ESC. That ESC hadn't been created, but you know, he, he was mm. led to start ESC as a result of his faith. You know, uh, journey. So I got to see that, and then I, you know, I went to we went to First Baptist Church here in Springfield, and I, I became got saved and, and baptized eight years old. Okay. So I'm always been in the faith community, but I've always my life has not been perfect either. So, you know, I've had my stumbles and, and things and it's just a constant thing where you've got to reevaluate where God wants you to be and what he wants you to do. And that's not, in Western society, we're focused a lot on, and it's an acceptable sin in the church to be greedy and to be chasing wealth and all these things that, that as Western culture, we are really all about sometimes, even yeah. in the church. Yeah. And, uh, it's kind of challenge. I'm always challenging myself on that. Is that really what God wants for me? And uh, that's kind of been my faith journey. It's like, yeah, started with an example, and then going to church and hearing lots of good messages from great leaders like you, and and just trying to process what's God trying to tell me with this, and like, what's my next step? So that's what I love about North Point. The next step is always there. Always is a next step for anybody. So, so okay. So generosity has been um, a major. Uh, you know, attribute of who you are. Obviously, it's impacted your business as well, but I know your family leads uh, with generosity. Um, and, and you have been part of the Generosity Council um, uh, and, and a, a collective uh, of people around the nation, but specifically in this area, who are encouraging others to be generous. Um, explain what that Generosity Council does um, and why it's important to you. Well, so because of that experience as a child, I, w- I was kind of always naturally programmed to be generous. And so through that process, I was observed to be generous by someone who invited me to an overnight generosity, what they call a jog, a journey of generosity, where you actually talk openly about generosity and, and what, why are you being blessed in these ways? And, and it's not that you share your financial statements, but you, you walk through some videos that sh- to show examples of generosity and you cry and you talk about it with other couples. And so they have men's versions and women's versions and couples versions of jogs. And so I did those, one of those several, several years ago after we kind of got into the Dave Ramsey thing, we kind of, we, through that circle of people that we knew got invited to one of these overnight events. And now I've been to several of those and then several of us in Springfield area that have gone to those and be, had seen the heart change that had we observed in our own lives and our families. Like we need more people to experience this. So 
we just self-formed a council that's kind of like dedicated to getting more people to go through these overnight generosity events where heart change happens. And there's no money, there's no ask. What I love about it is, you know, you're not asking for people at money. It's because when you invite somebody to a generosity event overnight at a nice, you know, lodge or hotel and you know yeah. the meals are funded, they're always waiting for yeah. the ask. Like right. what what am I going to have to pay for this experience? And there is nothing. It's funded by the generousgiving.org folks, which is has a foundation that funds it all. Yeah. And uh I just love it because people go in and they're kind of tentative and at the end of a weekend event, they're they're just on fire for this generosity message and we see it all the time and then people invite other people and then just kind of like self propagate So our council is a bunch of guys here in Springfield that have seen that, the power of that and we want more of that to happen in Springfield just yeah. for the heart change aspect of it. Now I was able to go with you right, one, yes. one weekend and um, in one of those guys groups and it was great to be able to just have the conversation about generosity. Um, you're exactly right. The whole time I'm thinking, okay, Where's the ask? Where's the right, pressure? Right. And the whole point was to get us to open up the dialogue of generosity and you left the application to all of us individually. Um, but it was powerful. And right. uh, so we have show notes here, opportunity for people to get more information. Um, what would you say if someone's listening and say, I might be interested if you promised there wasn't an ask, but I, I'd like <laughs> to know why is generosity so important and have some intentional time to sure. talk with others about it. W- what are some next steps? Well, I mean, they can go to generous, generousgiving.org and get like a preview of what the whole experience is and watch videos just to get a flavor for it. So that's the easy way. If they actually want to attend one, they can just send me an email and we as a council will process, because like, you got to pair them up with the right other people to be in the room and, and then yeah. pick a place to host the event. And, and they actually provide a facilitator. So they'll fly in somebody from another region of the country to actually come in and facilitate these things. Or sometimes there's some, some of us locally are trained to facilitate, but yeah. so yeah, drop me an email and I guess you'll put that, you can put that in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. Would, that would be Amazing. If we had a, yeah. if we had one person, if you're out there, and if you're listening, what's the email? <laughs> just just give us the oh, email. If you're listening, yeah, yeah. sbybe at escfirm.com. B y b e e b y b double e sbybe at esc f i r m dot com. It's firm. Yes. dot com. Esc firm. Okay, so um, let's let's talk a little bit more about the generosity. Um, it, at North Point uh, <laughs> is. We have, I would say, a third of North Pointers are people who um, would say they are all in on faith, faith disciplines, whether they, they came to North Point from a background of faith and discipline. Uh, disciplines including, I'm going to be generous with my time, I'm going to serve others, and be generous financially. Right. Um, the the All the ministry of North Point, whether it's services, Dream Center, is a direct result of people's generous giving, which probably a third of North Pointers um, understand shoulder. Now we don't do a weekly sermonette to right. put pressure on people giving. Right, which, which I prob- love because that aligns with the right, yeah. my no conflict personality and yeah. all that sort of stuff. And so. and people's uh, no interest uh, <laughs> personality on the receiving end. They do end. not want to hear that. No, <laughs> and, right. and so at the same time, mm-hmm. we have probably a third of our people who are followers of Jesus um, that um, North Point's where they want to go if they go. Right. And then we have probably a third of our people who um, aren't what they would consider uh, themselves to be followers of Jesus, but intrigued by the concept. Um, so talking to the two thirds of people, whether they're follower of Jesus or not, um, why is generosity, do you think, foundational to faith? What does that look like? What are some first steps for someone? Well, it's foundational to faith, but it's also foundational to the human experience. So that's another thing I love about generosity is I can have a discussion with anybody of any faith and there, there's no faith out there that I'm aware of that don't promote and value generosity. Whether or not they're, you know, Christ-based or not, everybody kind of agrees, most human beings on earth that generosity is a good thing. So that's yeah. great in of itself because I can, you talk to anybody and say, well, I, I believe in so-and-so and I, Jesus was not the son of God or whatever they might want to tell me, but we're both going to agree that generosity is a good thing to do. Right. So um, for the two thirds of people that are not actively giving, it's the uh, try it, even at whatever level that you want to start and just see how that goes because 
it is more blessed to give than receive. Like when, you, when I'm feeling crummy about the way things are going at the office or with my family, I will go try to out of my way to give money to anybody. I mean, if it's Sonic person serving at Sonic or whoever it is, I'll, and that makes me feel better. Right. It's just like, it is more blessed to give than receive. So there's, just try it. Um, one thing we say in the generosity circles is no one's ever tried generosity and it's like, nah, it didn't work for me. I'll do something else kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, just start. And that's why they're called journey of generosity. Cause it's not like you start at zero and then you go to like, oh, I'm gonna give 80% or 90% of my income and be full. It's a journey and not that everybody makes that, that path, right. but just take a step. It's the next step. My next step is to contribute some amount to North Point or whatever, wherever you're going to church, just start somewhere, be faithful a little bit, see how that felt, see what, how that went for you and just keep taking next steps. So uh, I love the, the practical example of um, being curious as to where your generosity can lead you if you're at Sonic. Right. So, so do you have like conversations with Robin or sit down and say, okay, what could we do to be generous outside of even a church context? How does that look like to even go on this brainstorming adventure of how can we be generous? We do have conversations about that, like for some of the big stuff where we support organizations at a bigger level. For all the little stuff that I do like that, she just knows I'm gonna do it and she rolls her eyes and she moves on. Cause she asks, <laughs> she'll ask me all the time, did you, did you give so much money to so-and-so? I'm like, I did, I did, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but she, it's, you know, it's kind of like shopping for her. She'll go shopping. I say, did you buy something? And like, yes, I did. So, you know, we, we're, we have an agreement that we can both. <laughs> There's reflect. worse advice. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, but I just really enjoy it. I mean, I get a kick out of seeing people smile. And pe- I mean, sometimes people cry and it's just, yeah, I just enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy the act of giving um, and it's fun. If you go to generousgiving.org, and we've got the, the, the show notes, it has that link. There's some really cool videos of right. practical ways that might be different than, like some people are adverse to hearing about giving. Mm-hmm. That's not what this is. Is when you go and you see some of the videos of like, I love like, um, I don't know if it's I love car or yep. whatever it is where, where these group of people said, hey, can we bless this one gal right. with a car? I mean, but, but you see these examples that, and then what they do, I would challenge all of our listeners, get curious right now. You're not listening on accident. How could you be generous and move the needle in someone's heart today? How can your generosity, whether it's a tip, whether it's a note, whether it's a gift, what can you do to open up someone's heart and mind today? Yeah. And, I, and I, if, we, if we live like that, I love it. It's a big deal. I mean, what we say in the generosity, one of the generosity means what I usually say is this is a divine appointment. You're not here by accident. Yeah. I mean, it sometimes seems like because you're throwing these groups of people together and to have one of these things, it's no accident those people, God God ordained that to be there. Same thing for anybody that's listening to this podcast, say they're not listening by accident. It is, this is a divine appointment. And yeah. if you can take a next step in the generosity space or whatever it may look like for you, that that's honoring to God and he is helping to set up the stage for what's gonna happen next in your life. But uh, on the generosity front, one thing I like to always remind people too is like, you can be generous with not just finances. People are like, oh, it's all about money I can give. And some people aren't gifted with extra finances or or whatever the case may be, but we use the acronym LIFE, labor, influence, finances, and expertise. You can be generous with all those things. So there's some people that, you know, are super generous with their service or expertise and, don't have it or aren't willing yet to give the financially, but you can still start giving in any one of those areas yeah. and it's still all honoring to God and it will be blessed. What do you have? Who are you? What lights you up? And point those arrows out in a way that, that blesses others. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close with speed round, okay? They gotta mm. be super quick. They gotta be a couple sentences. I'm not prepared for this. Oh, that's the, it. it's called the riff. Do it. Okay, right. um, what's your favorite thing about the Dream Center? Just impact on kids' lives. You, you see the kids coming and going, it's amazing. And smiles for kids that you know have tough tough conditions back home, but when you, you see them here, I see a lot of smiles. What makes a great employee? Team player, you know, the ideal team player, what, what they're willing to do for the team and not focus on themselves. Okay, uh, when you're uh, hiring someone and you're sitting, watching, observing, um, uh, how important is a personnel decision? How important is a personnel when you're getting ready to hire somebody? Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. You, it's we take a long time to hire. Don't make a mistake hiring because it's a lot easier to make a mis- you know to drag out and be sure about hiring the right person 
than trying to get that person off the team later. That's the pain is tenfold. Uh, any uh, any authors that you recommend everyone to read? Um, James Clear, Atomic Habits is one that I was just thinking about last week. There's some good stuff in there. And then anything by Dave Ramsey, I, I pass out the books at the ESC. Yeah. So if anybody wants to come by ESC, I'll give them a Dave Ramsey book. But uh, yeah, I'm not a huge reader. I'm a podcast person and I'm not, lead, I'm not reading as many books as I should. I You're familiar pass. with an incident waiting to happen? Mm. Oh, it's a good book. Okay. Jeremy Johnson, 2007. It's great. It's powerful. If you're a ninth grade kid in 2007, it would be powerful. I've heard about it, but I didn't know that was the title. Yeah, so we had yes. two reviews on Amazon. One of them's decent. <laughs> I remember you telling that story. Um, so, okay, so Scott, uh, what, you, what, what you represent to this community, what ESC, what your family, I know it's, it's so many people. Um, thank you so much for believing in a community, for taking what you have, your influence, your life, the acronym, sure. and, and helping add life to the community around you. I know whether it's the Dream Center, whether it's North Point, whether it's individuals out there through the generosity um, journey is I know that you're making an impact. And what I love about this, there's been times, you know, you said that when you give, there's something that you add life. When you give to others, it does something for you. Um, just organizationally, I've seen on the other end, when you felt prompted, or I don't know how spiritual it felt right. on your end, when you felt prompted to do something, you probably have no idea the answer to prayer and the timeliness it was on the other end. And I say that to you to say, man, thanks for doing what you're doing and it's a big deal. And I also say that to our listeners, never underestimate the prompts of God. That We, we believe that God's spirit, one of the five things we want is an awareness of God's spirit throughout the day. Don't underestimate that. God will speak to you. And if you listen to those prompts, there is a miracle on the other side of your obedience you might never know. So let's be generous people. Scott, you've been that, you've done that, you've received it, you've reflected it. So thanks for being on this show. Can't wait to win more trophies with you in <laughs> wiffle ball. We need and, to uh, and I think our listeners ought to have a trophy for listening to yet another episode of The Riff. We'll catch you on the flippity flip. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Riff. Submit a question for the podcast at northpointchurch.tv slash podcast. We'll have a brand new episode every week wherever you find podcasts.